Ladies and gentlemen, my name's Paul, and in this Regame to Decom video, we're going to be analysing tech news, which, as usual, has popped up over the past 24 or so hours. We'll be starting the video off with PCI Express 4 and 5, which are going to be rolling out over the next few years. And then move over to Camp Microsoft, specifically the Xbox One X, as Microsoft believe it's not really in competition with the PS4 Pro. Instead, in performance terms, it's much more in line with a high-performance PC. And also touch on Microsoft's drive into a mixed reality and then we're going to finish the video with a couple of intel related pieces of news the first is a mobile six core coffee lake because we actually have some geek bench data which tells us the rough performance of it and finally we'll have one last piece of intel news and that is intel are launching the xeon w cpus for workstations which are essentially based on the skylake sp architecture and are for the lga 2066 socket isn't that just spiffy anyway let's start out with pci express 4 and 5 shall we seems pretty interesting so pci sick which of course are the organization behind the pci specifications have confirmed that PCIe 4 will actually be finalized by the end of this year, which is quite interesting, and I imagine it's possibly going to upset quite a few people, given the plethora of PCIe 3 motherboards which are doing the rounds at the moment. So, when you consider PCIe 3 has been around for some time, we've had the bandwidth of this about seven years now, and yes, of course, at the time it was released, it was more than adequate. In fact, to be honest with you, Graphics cards of even a couple of years ago running at, like, PCIe 2 were fine. But, naturally, things evolve. And now that we've got faster drives available, for example, M2 NVE drives are coming cheaper. And I wouldn't say they're exactly prevalent, as in everyone's got them, but they're certainly getting to the point where more folks have them. And also, multi-GPU solutions are becoming increasingly popular. And this is especially true for those who are doing, say... Um, 3D work or perhaps even machine learning or, you know, individuals who are perhaps doing home uh, coding or whatever. Naturally, PCIe 4, therefore, is going to be doubling the bandwidth. We're going to be seeing 64 gigabytes per second. Even better than that, we should also see in 2019, about two years-ish, the release of PCIe 5. Guess what this does? You guessed it, folks. It doubles the bandwidth of PCIe 4. So this means that, in theory, we should have up to 400 GB Ethernet solutions. Naturally, this means we're going to have up to 128 gigabytes per second. That's at 16 times duplex. And, obviously, this is really good news for, once again, people who are investing in multi-GPU solutions or other high I.O. type of solutions. I'm going to quickly state the obvious. That means that if you are buying a new motherboard, let's say for the sake of argument, an AM4 motherboard, or perhaps even the mythical um, unicorn known as Coffee Lake's motherboard, and by mythical unicorn I mean the absolute baffling decisions of Intel with this, then essentially you're going to be stuck on PCIe 3 for the short term. But what is perhaps one small caveat is that the 0.9 specs have already been adopted by some manufacturers. So this is basically in preparation for launches in the not-too-distant future. Obviously, however, if you've already bought like a motherboard over the last couple of months, then that's just something to be aware of. However, before anyone comments asking if they're screwed, probably not. Do remember that PCIe 4 graphics cards, let's say for the sake of argument, they release a Pascal refresh in 2018, let's say, or, you know, whatever, it will be back with the compatible, and most likely, for the short term anyway, the next year or two, you're not going to probably miss that much performance from the jump, especially if you've only got a single card. Okay, so now we're going to move over to the Xbox One X and PS4 Pro. There is an awful lot of comparisons already flying around the internets for this, and frankly... I'm going to hold off on my whole thoughts for a while because I'm still waiting for all of the Hot Chips conference stuff to appear online. I did do a quick, a quick excuse me, uh, synopsis of what was revealed at Hot Chips, but not all the details have been published. And there are a couple of comparisons of Rise of the Tomb Raider, but honestly, I just haven't had time to do them myself. However, I have kind of checked them out, and there is definitely a visual difference between them. And I would go as far as to say that these. Xbox One X is significantly better looking than the PS4 Pro. That's just kind of how it is. But 
Obviously, it's a more expensive piece of hardware being released later, so that's kind of obvious, right? However, I don't necessarily agree with what Dave McCarthy has said. Now he, for those unfamiliar with the individual, he is the head of Xbox operations and general manager of Xbox services. That's quite the title. And he recently had an interview with the official Xbox magazine in the United Kingdom. So this is issue 155 for us Brits, if you want to go ahead and pick it up. And he said that I more make the comparison with the Xbox One X to what a higher-end PCs are doing right now. There's a big difference with 40% more processing power in terms of ensuring that co consistent frame rates, including the frame buffer that's going to get you all those 4K textures, ensuring spatial audio is going to be at a premium view. So really, it's a top-end experience. And then he said that he... <laughs> I don't see. I kind of agree with him there. Like that's fine. I I I, I was with him until that point. But this is where he somewhat loses me. But I think in terms of the this aspects of Xbox One X that I'd compare to the PS4 Pro in terms of HDR gaming, 4K streaming capabilities, and 4K Blu-ray support. There's only what, two consoles in the world that support 4K Blu-ray, and they're both Xbox Ones. And that is the Xbox One S and the Xbox One X. End quote. So he's essentially, not exactly, but he's essentially saying that the PS4 Pro's capabilities are more in line with the Xbox One X. He's doing it in a very sneaky way because obviously he's focusing on HDR and 4K video and that type of stuff. But obviously he's somewhat neglecting things such as, oh, I don't know, resolution and frame rate and, you know, visual fidelity. But, you know, of course he is going to do that because ultimately he's a marketing guy. I don't necessarily agree with him there. Um, uh, because obviously, like it or not, from Microsoft's perspective, Sony right now are on top in the console market. That's just a fact. Hopefully, someone will knock Sony off the perch because then that makes Sony work harder. There are a plethora of rumours doing the rounds right now, of course, of the PS4 will be superseded by the PS5 at some point in the next year or two, which basically is like me saying to you, well, if you jump into this river, you're going to be wet. It's obvious that Sony are going to do that, and quite frankly, I'm, I'm cool with that, because that means, once again, we're going to start moving forward in the hardware stakes. I think the PS4 has done really well in the marketplace. I really love some of the games that have been out. Like I've been playing uh, Uncharted Lost Legacy at the moment. Now, oh my god, that is a really good game. But I'm also keen for Sony to kind of get smacked a bit in the marketplace because that keeps them from being complacent. That's just how it is. You know, complacency kills companies. And we all know what happened to Sega when they got a bit complacent with the 32X thing, and then the Saturn, and then the Dream, it, it just wasn't a good look, and it's happened at various other companies before as well, so hopefully we don't see complacency set in, set in. and to be fair to Sony, they have kept on top of things, so let's just hope that, uh, let's just hope that this continues, but as for being competitive to a high-end PC, semi yes, semi no, I've got to say that Forza looks absolutely amazing on the Xbox One X. And from what I'm hearing, uh, I haven't done enough investigations on this, so please don't take this as me telling you this is a fact. Um, I wouldn't want to do that because that's misleading. But from what I'm hearing, from a very brief look as well online, the Rise of the Tomb Raider on the Xbox One X actually looks better in certain instances than a PC. Now, I don't know why that is. I don't know if they've simply redone some of the assets or what, um, but that is what it is. I'm not really surprised. After all, if the developers have obviously worked specifically on the Xbox One X version and done some tweaking, rather than using base code of Rise of the Tomb Raider, which of course was originally designed around the original Xbox One, and then of course it was tweaked for the uh, PS4 and PS4 Pro, respectively. So, obviously, it does make sense if they have improved those assets. So, yeah, I can kind of agree that it is in line with a high-end PC, but, obviously, it does have some drawbacks compared to a high-end PC. But, you know what? I was having a debate with someone online the other day, and I, I'm, I'm very confident to say that if you can't afford the outlay of a high-end PC, or you don't want to buy a PC, because I know some people just don't want to deal with them, which is fine, then I don't think you're going to be missing out a lot unless you've got a really high budget. We can start bringing other things in, like you do save money in the long run, possibly with a PC because of the sale of cheap games and, you know, whatever else. But, hey, some people just don't want to play on the PC, so I'm cool with that. It's moving forward in the marketplace. Hopefully Microsoft 
do good with the Xbox One X, you know, because honestly, they really screwed up the uh, initial launch of the Xbox One. Last little piece of news regarding the um, Xbox, uh, sorry, Team Microsoft, and that is the Microsoft are pushing for mixed reality. Um, and supposedly, this is also going to include Steam support, Halo virtual reality, and God knows what else. And from what we're hearing, Microsoft are working with 343 Industries to bring future Halo experience into mixed reality. They're not providing much in terms of specifics. But hey, it sounds pretty cool to me. I'll link an article if you want more information in the video description, which is an official Microsoft blog. And quite frankly, this looks really cool. I'm actually really looking forward to that. And virtual reality at the moment isn't quite where we want it to be. Headsets are too expensive. You know, support has just been... Yeah, I think we all know the problem is support. So I'm hoping Microsoft being thrown into the fray does improve things a little bit. Obviously as well, we've had HTC Vive's price cuts and Oculus Rift, although HTC are not doing exactly amazing in finances at the moment. And supposedly they're trying to spin off uh, the, their, their virtual reality, excuse me, division. Anyway, uh, Intel are also preparing, they're readying, they're bracing it, don't you know, the six core mobile Coffee Lake H. Uh, this is a Geekbench database entry. You can probably guess what I'm going to say. It's not bad for a mobile processor. You're looking at a single core performance of just 4013, so it's not exactly world breaking. However, the multi thread score is just over 19,000, 19,129, which is pretty good. I mean, once again, it's, well, a mobile processor, right? And this also has 12 threads, so that's good. 9 megabytes of level 3 cache, and a clock speed of 2.6 gigahertz nominal, which, once again, is fairly impressive considering I'm considering that just several years ago mobile processors were pretty much about as effective as i don't know morse code is communicating then you can start seeing you know it's just to me it's just amazing how quickly we've come in terms of mobile and obviously this is going to continue next up we're going to talk about the xeon w series of processors now these share a lot of similarities with the Skylake X, but they are meant more for professional workstation-based environments. There are, however, at least architecturally, a lot of similarities, but with a few inherent differences. They are still using the LGA 2066 socket, but when it comes to the chipset, it's different. We'll get into that in just a second. So the actual lineup has a number of SKUs, with the bottom one being the Xeon W2123. This one's actually quite interesting because it actually has a total of 8.25 megabytes of level 3 cache. And you'd expect, because it only has 4 cores, 8 threads, to have just 5.5 megabytes of level 3 cache, based upon the fact that each uh, Skylake SP core has 1.375 megabytes of level 3 cache allocated to it. The top of the line, and this is going to sound very familiar as well, is the Xeon W2195. It looks very similar on paper to the um, to the 7980XE, but with a sm couple of small differences. It's running at a base clock of uh, 2.3 GHz, turbo of 4.3 for the Turbo 2. The cores are 18 and 36, but the primary difference is support for professional level applications and features. We have extended memory support, vPro, Intel's AMT, and what they consider to be enterprise reliability, serviceability, and availability, which is known as RAS features. Now, it does, as I just hinted at, require an entirely new chipset. I can hear you, you know, jumping for joy already. And this chipset is known as the C422 chipset. So, here's the kicker. It looks like it's not going to be compatible with the X299 chipset. Unfortunately, we're going to have to wait for full confirmation on that, but it doesn't appear likely. So, what that means is the companies like uh, MSI, Asus, and other manuf uh, motherboard manufacturers are going to need to pump push out at least one more version of a board for the enterprise market. So, overall... There are a couple of inherent differences we can see. Uh, for start, 
Skylake X 79X, uh, 7980XE, excuse me, has 18 cores, 36 threads, and looks very close to the Xeon lineup, but also you have the additional PCIe lanes that have bumped them up from 44 to 48, which admittedly is kind of minuscule, but hey, I'll take them. And DRAM support goes up to 512 gigabytes, which is obviously considerably more. And this is both RDIM as well as LRDIM support as well. And it's still using quad channels, so it's still not as good as, like, let's say, the Xeon 8180s. But hey, it is naturally considerably cheaper as well, because those things can cost, like, you know, $13,000. Obviously, Intel have not... Um, divulge the price of these yet. Now, finally, there is another little caveat as well. When it comes to the distribution of PCIe lanes, even the lower end SKUs, for example, the 8 cores, do not have smaller numbers of lanes. They've still got 48. To be honest, they should have done this with the Skylink X lineup. They should have just kept 48 or 44 or whatever through the entire set of processors and I, I feel it's kind of baffling that they didn't end up doing that, quite frankly. The best way you can think of the Xeon Ws is basically the middle ground before, before you go with the full multi-socket Xeons, the higher-end ones, for example, the SP Golds or whatever, but also, obviously, is a slightly higher and more professional level than the X299s. So this would be for folks who perhaps are doing a lot of VM work and Maybe they need to allocate a vast amount of memory per core, uh, sorry, per virtual machine instance. But on the other hand, X299 would be maybe for a little bit of VM work or perhaps more content creation, 3D modeling. You get the idea.